In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Every year on the Sunday before Christmas, we hear the Gospel passage that tells the, all the generations that go from, Christ, uh, from Abraham to Christ. And all in all, there's, there's 42 generations that are included. And it's very easy to get lost in the sea of names uh, that come at us in this Gospel passage, especially when we hear it first in Greek and then we hear it again in English. Uh, it's very overwhelming to hear all these names, many of which are not familiar to us. And even if we studied the Old Testament very diligently, the names would still be kind of hard to uh, associate the names with the characters in the Bible. But the Gospel writer Matthew, he puts a little section in there in today's Gospel passage that kind of helps us really to break down uh, the significance of Christ and His coming into the world. Matthew writes that from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the time of the deportation to Babylon is 14 generations. And from the time of the deportation to Babylon to Christ is 14 generations. And so Matthew gives us these three milestones, these three road markers to, to show where the critical moments in the story of the, uh, of the ancient people of Israel leading up to Christ were. The coming of the first king of Israel, who is David. The time when Jerusalem fell as a city and was captured by Babylon, and the people were exiled into Babylon. And then finally, the coming of Christ. So we have these three very clear, momentous occasions, so to speak, that are uh, turning points in the story of ancient Israel. Each of these three different milestones marks the end and the beginning of an era of ancient Israel. So for example, we have the time from Abraham to David. And this was the time where Israel was, where they were nomads. They lived in tents, walking from place to place. And yet even so, they carried with them the most precious uh, relics of their time, the Ark of the Covenant and the tablets of the, of the commandments that Moses received on the, on the mountaintop. And everywhere they went, they were being directed by God. And they lived by a promise that God had made to Abraham. And again, Abraham's the first name that we hear on this day. And God makes a promise to Abraham, even though he's very old and he has no children, he tells him, I will make you a father of many nations. And your descendants will be as many as the sands of the sea. And this, of course, comes true in that he bears his son, Isaac, and then bears Jacob, and then so on and so forth until we get to Christ. And so Israel was living in this time on the promise that God had made to Abraham, that he would make them a great nation with many people and make them a strong people where they were living. But again, they were nomads. They didn't have a real home. They were walking from place to place. And really everything they did was based on God's promise. That promise is fulfilled in a sense. Uh, we hear the story of Moses coming out of Egypt with the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. And they enter into the promised land. The land that God told them he would give them. That he promised them that he would give them. And eventually the Israelites go into this promised land. And they're continuing, continually fighting and fighting and fighting to take over all these lands that God has promised them. And they do. And finally, they capture a city called Jerusalem. And Jerusalem becomes their capital. And David is chosen by God to become their first king. And this is the end of that nomadic period, of the period where they were just living on God's promise, to now being an established nation being a people that are strong, not only uh, in their faith, but also politically. And David led them in battle, and he was victorious in battle, but he also led them spiritually, and he even wrote parts of the Old Testament that we still use today. So now we leave this first era, and we come into the second era of the kingdom. And now God begins to work more through his kings, speaking to them and guiding them to lead the people, not only to be strong politically, as I said, but also in their faith to God. Because as God had promised Abraham, as long as they worshipped him, as long as God was their God and they did not take other gods, he would be with them and he would not abandon them. And so now 
living in Jerusalem, the Jews are becoming strong. They build the temple. They build their house of worship, just like we have here at Panagias. And they are praising God in their new temple. And things are going well. Until little by little, their kings turn away from God. And they turn their back on God. And eventually, the, the rulers become so wicked that they have become completely separated from their Lord who had given them everything. And so what happens at the end of this second era is that Jerusalem falls. Jerusalem is captured by the empire of Babylon. And the people are taken from their home in Jerusalem to live in a place far, far away. And this was devastating for the Jews. This was devastating for the nation of Israel because everything that they had been believing about God was based on this Jerusalem, on their homeland, and on their king. And now all of that had been taken away from them. So the second era closes, and the third era begins in Babylon, where the people are now in exile. But even though they're in exile, and everything that they had believed in had been taken away, they still had faith and hope and a promise that God would restore their kingdom, and that God would bring along a new king, who would restore the line of David and would make them a great and powerful nation once again. And so they were expecting and hoping for another king like David to be a military leader, to walk into Jerusalem with his army and throw out the Babylonians and throw out eventually the Romans who had taken captive over them and to establish Israel again as a great and powerful nation. But as we see the end of this era closing, the line of David does not come to a great military leader that they were expecting. The line of David comes to Jesus of Nazareth, who was born of Joseph and Mary in a cave in Bethlehem. And this closes, so to speak, the third era of the Israelites' history, this era of exile, this era of homelessness and being captive into an era of freedom and of being back in their homeland. But just the end of the third era is also the beginning of the new era. And Christ ushers in this new era, not by taking political control of Jerusalem, but by establishing a new Jerusalem, by establishing the kingdom of God on earth. In this kingdom, all the things that had gone wrong are remade. They're reestablished once again in Christ. In this new era of his human history, there is forgiveness between God and man. There is reconciliation between heaven and earth. There is union between God and man in Christ. There are the blessings and the gifts of God given once again freely to human beings and all people who follow Him in faith. There is <clears throat> the resurrection and the overcoming of death uh, that had taken us captive for so many, so many generations. This new kingdom that Christ came to bring is none other than our holy Orthodox Church that we are standing in today. Christ didn't come with armies and with horses. He came with apostles and disciples who went out into the world and built churches and baptized and chrismated new Christians into his faith. And everywhere they went, they spread this new kingdom throughout all of the world. We are inheritors of this kingdom. We are sitting in this kingdom right now. That we are in the very kingdom of God itself. We experience this kingdom very personally, very acutely in the sacraments of the church, in our baptisms, where we, we receive the very power to overcome death as Christ did. In our chrismation, where we, we receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit that God now sends freely down upon us and upon His church in our Holy Communion, which gives us union with God and gives us all the power to live the Christian life when we leave this church and go back into our homes. In the Sacrament of Holy Confession, where we are forgiven of our sins. And in all these different ways, we come to know who Christ is. Because in this new kingdom, God does not act through prophets. God does not act through priests. God does not act through kings and rulers. God acts Himself in the very person of Jesus Christ. We see Him and we touch Him. We taste Him. We taste His body and we taste His blood. We hear His words in the Holy Scriptures. And, that way, and in that way, our life becomes very, very full with the life of God. 
so that when one day we leave this earthly life, we leave the kingdoms of this earth, we will not be journeying again into a foreign place. We won't have to go somewhere that we're not familiar with. We'll be going into our very own homes in the kingdom of God where we've been all this time. In the birth of Christ, every year when we celebrate the feast of Christmas, Christ is telling us again and again and again, I love you. I love you. Look at what I am giving to you and look at what I offer to you freely as my people. And all he asks for us to do is to follow him faithfully, to be in his church with him, to come into his house and sit at his banquet table just as we do um, during the holidays in our family homes, to also come to our Heavenly Father and to be with him in his home and to taste of his banquet feast. There is no greater gift that we can receive this time of year than the love of our God and Savior. And so I hope and, we pr and I pray that as we go forward in our lives, not only to our, our, Christmas, our Christmas trees and our presents and our, our, our family gatherings, but also every day that comes after that, that we will live a life that is worthy of this gift. Because again, the gift is only as good, as I've been saying now for the last few weeks in my, my remarks, a gift we receive is only as good as much as we use it. And so God is calling us to a new life and to a new existence and a new reality and a new kingdom. And we are called to live a life according to that calling. I hope that God will inspire us and put this love for him in our hearts so that we can become his children, so that the genealogy of Christ will not end with Christ, but will continue with our very own names. Because even though Christ had no earthly children, he has many children in spirit. He has many children through his church. So it is our names that are supposed to be the ones that come next after Jesus. Our names that are supposed to fill out the list of the kingdom of heaven and its citizens and its people. May God bless all of you this Christmas season with the joy and every blessing from above. May God fill our hearts with forgiveness and love for one another, with charity and with mercy. And may God reconcile us with him even though we sin constantly against him so that we can experience his love even here on this earth. And so that when, again, as I said, we leave this earth, we can walk into our eternal home in the kingdom of heaven. Amen.